I have made my decision. I have staked my claim. I have drawn a line in the sand, and I won't be ashamed with the world behind me and the cross before. By the grace of God, I will serve the Lord. And I have made my decision. I have staked my claim. I have drawn a line in the sand. And I won't be ashamed with the world behind me and the cross before by the grace of God, I will serve the Lord. I have made my decision. I have staked my claim. I've drawn a line in the sand. And I won't be ashamed with the world behind me and the cross before by the grace of God, I will serve the Lord. Amen. I trust that that is your determination and your desire is to serve the Lord no matter what. And that you have made up your mind and uh, you're determined you're going to hold out to the end. Hallelujah. Glad that you've joined us this morning for the Sunday morning service I uh, appreciate it so much, glad for your faithfulness, and um, there's, these have been some trying weeks, the last six weeks here, but um, seems to be and appears to be a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we're trusting that here in just the, the next couple of weeks um, that we're going to be able to get back to some, uh, some type of a service, and uh, we will be getting back with you and get in touch with you uh, on that, be pay, staying in um, uh, up to date there on Facebook and then uh, be getting a letter out as well uh, just to inform you about when we're going to open up the service <clears throat> and what it's going to be like and what we're going to be doing so anyway keep that in mind be praying and uh, just asking the Lord to uh, continue to help us and uh, that things would um, uh, just get a whole lot better uh, very quickly but uh, we're glad that you're here may the Lord richly bless you amen let's worship the Lord together and sing it Bye. 
glad that we can cast our cares on the Lord and and the Bible teaches us that the reason that we're able to do that is because he cares for us hallelujah and I'm so grateful for the the care and the concern of God and uh, it's, it blows the mind just to uh, imagine that the God of the universe the one who created everything uh, spoke it all into existence, breathed out the stars, calls them all by name, holds it together by the word of his power, that he would be concerned 
about you and I. Amen. Uh, concerned about every need, about every area and aspect of our life, and it doesn't matter how big uh, or how small uh, it may seem to you or anybody else, God cares. And uh, he said that we can bring our cares and we can cast them upon him. And we're going to do that right now. Uh, we're just going to go to the Lord in prayer and believe God uh, to help us. And uh, no matter what the need that you might have in your life, what uh, your uh, uh, is represented uh, here, and I know that it um, these uh, videos here have have gone beyond just our uh, local body um, of, of believers. The seventy five or eighty or so that we have from week to week, um, it's reached far beyond that. Um, and so, no matter where you're at, if you're uh, a part of this local body and it's a Fletcher Assembly of God, or um, or someplace else. Amen. God knows what your need is, and he wants to help you. I want you to pray with me now, and let's just believe God uh, to meet the needs that are represented. Father, we are grateful again for the wonderful privilege of prayer, this opportunity that we have to come. We can come boldly before your throne of grace, obtain mercy, and find grace to help in our time of need. Lord, what a privilege it is for us to bring in, uh, our needs and cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, we're thankful for that this morning, Lord, and as we bring the needs and uh, whatever they are represented across uh, our local body and just across the country, Lord, span the miles to where those needs are right now. Lord, you see the one that is reaching out in faith. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would reach down a hand of mercy and grace, bring healing to those that are sick in body, rebuke the sickness, we curse it in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Lord, that healing virtue would flow into those bodies. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, uh, by your stripes, we are healed, and we believe that, and we stand upon it now. In the name of Jesus, we're asking you to do what only you can, and a miracle take place in Jesus' name. Not only the physical needs, but, Lord, whatever it might be, be it physical, financial, spiritual, uh, family situations, Lord, uh, no matter what is needed, be it guidance and direction, comfort and strength, we know that you can meet the need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, most of all, we pray for those that are lost in sin. Each and every one of us have lost loved ones that need to be saved. We're asking you, Lord, that Holy Ghost conviction would grip their hearts right now. Speak to them. Deal with their hearts. Deal with their lives. Draw them to yourself. Open their eyes to see their desperate need of you. Bring them into the altar of repentance before it's eternally too late. We ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. We thank you, we praise you, we give you the glory and the honor that you alone are worthy of. Hallelujah. Where else can we turn, Lord? You alone have the words of life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, we praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Hallelujah.
God, praise God. What a wonderful privilege that we have to be able to call on the name of the Lord, to be able to touch Him. Amen. Uh, I know I've said this a lot of times before folks say, well, I'd like to have been alive when Jesus was here on earth and like to have been there. Well, uh, I guess that sounds good, except it would have uh, been kind of sketchy whether or not you would have um, uh, been able to get anything out of it. Uh, most of us being Gentiles, um, uh, how would uh, we have ever even uh, been able to be a part of that? Uh, and, uh, but right now, we're living in, in the, the best time, hallelujah, because um, by faith, amen, uh, we can all touch him. Doesn't matter where we're at, don't have to be at a certain locality, locality. don't have to be at a certain place, certain church, or uh, it, we can all, by faith, touch him and uh, receive from him. What a wonderful privilege we have. Amen. I want to go to the Lord, uh, uh, get into our, our word here tonight, go to the, the word, and I um, want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23 is where we're going to start. These are familiar verses, but Hebrews chapter number 10 and we're going to begin with verse number 23. It says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to preach to you a little bit here uh, this morning about what we've learned from not being in church. What we've learned from not being in church. Now, we, um, uh, that, that's been the case here for the last five, six weeks. Uh, not been able to meet at our regular time, not been able to come together uh, three or four times a week as we uh, normally do Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday night for youth, uh, the Wednesday night Awana and all the things. And so we've all been missing that, and, uh, or at least I hope you've been missing that. Um, but I, I want to talk to you here about, about some things that we, um, I hope that we've learned or that we should have learned or, or I want us to learn from not being in church. I want to start out here with a statement that I've made on several other occasions, and uh, the longer that I live for God, the more convinced I am of its truth. Uh, the statement is this, the Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. I want you to think about that. I've said it before, so if you've heard me preach very often, you, you've heard me say this, the Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. God never intended for us to just draw back. There's no such thing, shouldn't ever be such a thing as a closet Christian. Uh, the Christian life was intended, all of its dynamics, all of the things, the, the commandments, the things that Jesus intended and taught for us to do, it was intended to be lived out uh, publicly, amen, amongst other people. God didn't call us to be a hermit on a hill or a monk in a monastery. He called us to live our lives, our Christian lives, publicly among other people. Uh, and, and, and more specifically, in, in, the Old, in, or in the New Testament, uh, as the church, over and over again, um, we, we find the terms together and one another and uh, one with another and, and, and other terms like that. And it's over and over again uh, that, that, that it's, and each time it emphasizes the importance of doing our Christian duty together. Amen. Um, how, are, how are we to fulfill the commandment to love, uh, uh, love one another? And, um, and, and, and Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have loved one to another, 
How can we do that by ourselves? Can't be done. You, you, you can't love one another if you're not near one another to be able to demonstrate that love. Amen. What about forgiveness? All of the scriptures are about forgiveness and about the fruits of the Spirit and how that those, I mean, you know what? I don't, I don't ever have any trouble with the fruits of the Spirit by myself. As long as I don't have to mess with anybody, and don't have to come into contact with anybody, don't have to do, I mean, all of them fruits of the Spirit, I, can, I treat myself really good. But that's, that's not the point. Amen. The, the fruits of the Spirit being developed in our lives what was, to, was to teach us how to interact with one another. Amen. And so the Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. And our text is an example of one of these passages of Scripture that uh, emphasizes the importance of doing our Christian duty together. Verse number 25 reveals the importance of church attendance to our spiritual survival. If we're going to be able to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering and be able to encourage uh, and exhort other believers to do the same, uh, then we're going to have to be faithful to the house of the Lord. That's what our text pretty much teaches us. That in order to be able to survive spiritually and do the things that that they're teaching us to do, that being in the house of the Lord, coming to church, is vital to that. Now, I I believe that if we love God, uh, then we're going to love the people of God. Can anybody say amen to that? I know you're sitting on your your, uh, couch there or in your recliner. Uh, in your PJs. I hope you're not doing that, but maybe you are. Uh, but anyway, if you're uh, sitting there uh, just chillaxing and, and listening to me, amen, could, 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 you, could you just help me preach a little bit right now? Amen. If we love God, uh, then we're going to love the people of God. Amen. And if we love God and the people of God, then we're going to desire to be in God's house with God's people. Amen. Uh, there, there, there's, that's good preaching. Uh, uh, there's something special about being together with God's people in God's house. I like what David said in Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2. He said, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. And then verse number 2, listen to what it says. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee, where at? In the sanctuary. Amen. Here David longed to experience God and his presence in a very specific way. He wanted to see God's power and his presence like he had seen him in the house of the Lord. There was something that David longed for and experienced. He hungered for it. He thirsted for it. His soul was desperate to experience God in a way that he had experienced him in the sanctuary. I believe that every true born-again believer experiences that same longing that David had. We want to be in God's presence. Amen. Amen. In God's house and with God's people. If you're truly born again and, and uh, you're, you're a, a, a born again believer, you're going to want to be uh, where God is at with his people in his house. We, we want that. We long for that. We're just like David. We desire that in our souls. And I, I, I trust that that many of you and all of you, amen, are, are desiring and looking for. I know that I am longing for that time when we can gather back together, amen, and, 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 and have church and, and enjoy the presence of God together, amen, like we, like we normally do. The, tr- the, the traditional uh, church service uh, and schedule of services has been designed to meet and fulfill that desire. That, that the desire that, that David had there, oh God, thou art my God, early will I see thee, my soul thirsts for thee, flesh longs for you, uh, to see your power, and uh, as I, I've seen thee in the sanctuary. The traditional church service and the schedule of services are designed to meet and fulfill that desire. 
we come together on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and you gather again, uh, gather together again on a Friday night. We have church each time. We preach. We pray. We sing. Amen. Why do we do all those things? Because that's what our hearts desire and long to do. We want to be in God's presence with God's people in God's house. Amen. And so the traditional church service as we know it was designed to fulfill that. And, and, and I'll just be honest with you here. It does a good job of that. That's why we do it. Amen. Because it fulfills. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. But, but it, it, it fulfills those desires that we have. For this reason, I, I don't believe uh, that the importance of faithful church attendance could ever be overemphasized. And again, if you've um, been around me very long and you've heard me preach very much, you know that I talk about it quite often. Amen. I believe that, that church attendance is vital. It's important. And when we can, we ought to join together at God's house. Now, what about these last six weeks? <laughs> uh, you talk about a struggle. I mean, it has been... Uh, quite, we have been forced uh, by circumstances outside of our control um, to uh, cancel our traditional church services. And again, I want you to remember our, our traditional church service um, and schedule of services that are designed to meet that desire that David had to be in God's house, to be in God's presence, to see his power, to see his glory. We've been forced by circumstances outside of our control to abandon that and to cancel that for a number of weeks here. And it would be a shame for us to simply, uh, well, to not learn anything from it. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a shame for us to simply endure this time and not learn some things from that so that we can grow, that we can... Uh, mature, that we can be better on the other side of this than we are right now. I remember years ago, I was, um, I was still in Bible school, and this would have probably been the back-to-school revival. I don't recall if it was the fall revival uh, or the, uh, uh, the spring semester back-to-school revival. So it was either in September of 92 or... Uh, January of 93. That was a long time ago, uh, longer for some than for others. Some of you, it was longer than a lifetime ago um, back in those days. But Brother Taylor was preaching, and um, that week of revival, of course, he was still pastoring out, out there in, uh, in, in Virginia, and um, he, there had been several um, difficult things that have happened in his in his personal life, he had suffered um, some very significant losses um, and then even physically had, had endured some, some very difficult things. And so he had, um, during that week, he had related some of those events and used some of those uh, tragic circumstances and difficult times to illustrate some of his messages, some of his sermons. And I remember later in the week, um, it was. It was. I, it could have even been on the last night of the revival. I, I don't recall. Uh, but late in the week, he 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 referred as he was starting to serve. He referred back to. He was just in the beginning of his sermon for that night, and he was referring back to during the week how he had told those stories and all of the things that had happened to him and the hard times and the bad times. And I remember him saying this, and I, it 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 uh, jumped out to me, and I I grabbed a hold of it, and I've tried to. Uh, you know, uh, have it ever since. I mean, he said, I would hate to think that I had been through all of those things and I didn't learn anything from it. He said, I'd hate to think that I'd been through all the things that I've been through and not learned anything from it. To have gone through the hardship, to go through the trial, to go through the difficulty, to suffer the loss, and to not get anything or any benefit out of that. What a tragedy that would be. So I want to talk to you here for just a little while on, on that thought. What we've learned from not being in church. 
what we've learned from not being in church. Now, there's probably I, there are a lot more than what I've got time to talk about here this morning. But if you'll just bear with me, I, I want to talk about four things very quickly here. First of all, I hope that we've learned, and then maybe I should have entitled that, things that I hope that we should have learned or whatever. But I hope we've learned that church, and what I mean by that is a church service, church is a means and not an end. I want you to think about that. Church or a church service is a means and not an end. As I mentioned earlier, the traditional church service is designed to meet and fulfill certain needs. Um, and, and, it, and it does a good job of that. Uh, the church service is, is the means by which we accomplish certain ends. Uh, there, there are needs that have to be met. There, there's something that we're shooting for. There is a goal uh, that we're trying to achieve, an end that we're trying to accomplish. And the church service... Uh, is a means to that end. So what are the ends? I, again, I don't have time to get, run through all of them. There, you could probably, I'm, I'm going to name several here, and you could probably name that many or more uh, that, I, that I haven't mentioned. But uh, here, here's some ends that, that the church service is a means to that end. Uh, first of all, is corporate worship. Uh, being able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Uh, the church service provides an opportunity and an atmosphere, amen, where we can join together and worship God as he deserves to be worshiped. Uh, another is corporate prayer, amen, being able to pray and believe together and, and uh, help one another pray, to pray one for another, amen, not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, being able, but being able to lay hands as, as James talks about, laying hands on, on one another and praying for one another. The church service gives opportunity for that. Preaching of the word, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, you get everybody in, in one place and get them all sitting down, Amen. And the, 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 the preacher, the man of God, amen, gets up there and he begins to preach God's word as the Holy Ghost anoints him. Then there's fellowship. Amen. There's that, that uh, being able to come together and fellowship with those of like precious faith and the, the body of believers. Amen. What a wonderful opportunity. Then there's exhortation. Not just from the pastor to the pulpit, uh, from the pulpit to the pew, but uh, being able to exhort one another. Even in our text here tonight, uh, it talked about uh, exhortation, amen, and exhorting one another, amen, and then encouraging one another. I mean, it's, the church gives wonderful opportunity for that. The church service, uh, discipleship. Amen. Teaching uh, and training. Amen. Sunday school and uh, uh, even uh, the, the, the Wednesday night Bible studies, the Awana uh, uh, classes and all of the other. I mean, uh, teaching, training people, discipleship. And then, uh, I mean, uh, certainly not least here, but the last one on my list here, uh, but to encounter God's power and his presence. I mean, the, the church service gives us opportunity to be able to uh, usher in the presence of God, the power of God, and then around the altars to be able to encounter that power and that presence. So the church service is a means to those ends. But when the means that we're using to accomplish the end is no longer available, we have to figure out another way to accomplish the end. And that, that, that's, that's what we've been doing for the last six weeks, I hope. Amen. Is figuring out another way to accomplish those ends. We can't just leave it undone. Well, we're not in church. I guess can't worship. We're not in church. Can't pray. Not in church. Can't have, have the preaching. Not in church. Can't fellowship. Not in church. We can't exhort and encourage. There's no discipleship going on. Can't encounter, encounter the power and the presence of God. What a shame it would be. That just because the means is out there that we usually use to accomplish those ends, that the ends go unaccomplished. You see, the danger is that sometimes we, we make the means the end. When folks come to the house of the Lord and they check it off, well, I've, I've done it. I've done church. 
I, I've been to the house of the Lord. Poop, I've done my Christian duty for the week. I've, I've done the, listen, church is not the end. It's not the thing to check off the list of uh, things to do. It's not, uh, I, I've been to church so I've met my uh, spiritual uh, uh, duty for the week or, or uh, my responsibility. No, it is a means to some greater ends. Just being together, just coming together as a club, amen, is not the end, but it's simply the means to an end. What I hope that we learn from not being in church is to focus more on the ends than on the means. Amen. When we are able to return to church, amen, we don't just go through the motions, amen, but we realize that this is an opportunity for us to meet an end. Amen. Whenever we come back, whenever that is in the next several weeks here, when it's time to worship, that we don't just sing the songs and sit there on our hands and not do anything, but we enter in. Amen. This is, there's an end to this. There, there's something we're trying to accomplish. Be it prayer, during the preaching of the word. Don't just sit there like a bump on a log, but engage the, the, the ministry of the words. Amen. Listen and, and pay attention. Fellowship with one another. Take opportunity. Don't think, well, I'll shake their hand next week. Or, I, oh, well, they know I love them. And I told them I loved them a year ago. And, and if I change their mind, I'll let them know. And, and, you know, just, but take the time to fellowship and exhort one another, encourage one another. Amen. Let's make sure that we meet the ends even during this time when the means is not available. And we can go on, and I, I've got to hurry here, but. I mean, we, we need to take some time, even during this, these, these weeks, I, I trust that, I mean, that's what we've been doing with these uh, uh, services here that we've been recording, amen, trying to get the word out to you, uh, be able to enjoy in the singing and all of that on Sunday morning, hallelujah, uh, but you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone to try to fellowship and give calls, amen, and uh, fellowship with one another, exhorting one, praying and seeking God's face, amen, we, we, we've got to, we've got to accomplish the ends. Secondly, second thing that I hope that we've learned while not being in church is that the church is not brick and mortar, but rather it's people. I, I know that I'm not the only one that's said this, and others have, have, have made this point, and you, this is not anything new. Hopefully you understand that. The church is not brick and mortar, but rather it's people. Uh, we say things like, well, I'm going to go to church, or I'm going down to the church, and what we mean by that is we're going to the building located on 202 South Martin. Amen. But, but it's this building, uh, it's this structure. Is this really the church? And you say, well, I'm going to go down to the church, the church. Is this really the church? This building, this, this edifice here? A few years ago when we talked about remodeling the church, what do we mean by that? Well, we were talking about remodeling a building, amen, going through the walls and the ceilings and the floors and, the, uh, and everything else, all the trim and the doors and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that we were talking about this structure, but is that the church? I mean, we were remodeling the church, it, but is this the church? You see, even though we have dedicated this structure, this building to the work of the Lord and have designated as God's house and we reverence it as such. This pile of brick and mortar is not the church. Amen. It is the place where the church meets, but we, we are the church. People are the church. You and I, we are the church. Hallelujah. And just because we can't meet together doesn't mean that we can't have church. Amen. Brother Micah preached about this early on several weeks ago. I believe it was on his uh, first uh, Friday night uh, message that he preached. Uh, he talked about, uh, you know, having church, uh, you know, outside. I don't remember the exact uh, uh, title of the sermon. But, uh, but anyway, he talked about that, that we don't have to be right here in order to have church. We don't have to be right here in order to experience the, we don't have to be right here in order to see those ends that we talked about earlier, that worship and prayer and the preaching of the word and fellowship and discipleship and encouragement and, and feeling the presence of God and all those things, we don't have to be here for those things to happen. 
Because we are the church. Amen. This building is not the church. It's a place that we've dedicated to God's, um, to, to, the, to the work of the Lord. We've dedicated it as God's house. We've designated it as such. We reference it as such. Amen. We call it the church from time to time. But this really isn't the church. It's just a building. Again, it's kind of a means to an end. But when we can't use this means, hey man, it doesn't mean we can't have church. Hey man, just because we can't come and sit in a, in a pew together doesn't mean that we can't uh, uh, experience uh, the power. It doesn't mean that we can't be the church. It means that even if we can't come to the building at 202 South Martin, the church can still flourish. Amen. The church can still be strong. The church can still grow. The church can still be everything that God intended for it to be. At least it should. Huh? I said at least it should. Because the church isn't this. Amen. We are the church. Hallelujah. Amen. And we can still flourish. We can still be strong. We can still grow. We can still be everything that God intended for us to be. At least we should be everything God intended for us to be. Third thing that I hope that we've learned is that our relationship with God is personal and not corporate. As we've already pointed out, our Christian life is to be lived out in public among other people and with fellow believers. But our relationship with God cannot be maintained by someone else or for someone else. Did you hear me? I said our relationship with God cannot be maintained by someone else, nor can it be uh, uh, maintained for someone else. It is a personal relationship with God. Amen. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. We can't come to the house of the Lord, amen, and maintain one another's relationship with God. If you have a living, loving relationship with God, it's because you've learned to maintain it on a personal basis. Too often church goers rely on the church service. Listen to me. Too often church goers rely on the church service and other church members to maintain their relationship with God. Come on now. We rely on other people, amen, in the church services. I mean, there, there are people who they read their Bible when the pastor reads his text. And that's about it. They read their Bible when the Sunday school teacher calls on them. And that's about it. They pray whenever we come to the altar and pray together. And that's about it. Amen. They, they worship whenever we play music and sing songs. That's about it. They're, they're relying on the church service and other church members to maintain their relationship with God. Friend, it can't, it can't work. That, that's not the way it was intended to work. Yes, we get help from it. I, I understand that. Yes, it's wonderful to be able to come together, and I'm encouraged, and I'm helped, and that's, that's part of it. And coming to church is part of our personal relationship with God because we come in obedience. All of that I, I understand. But you cannot rely on the church service and other believers to maintain your relationship with God. Many don't have a relationship with God outside of the corporate church setting. And what a shame. Now, I, 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 folks are finding that out right now. They're realizing and recognizing that, man, what I had, it wasn't much. I hope they're sensing that. I hope that they're recognizing, man, I, I've, I've slacked up here. I, I, I need to, uh, without the church, man, I've really been dry spiritually. And I need, I need to learn how to, how to get a hold of that. That's true in your life. After these six weeks, you've surely come to realize that you cannot maintain a relationship with God in that manner. You won't survive. You cannot maintain a relationship with God 
by just relying on church services and, and, what, uh, and other believers and what they can do. Amen. You're going to have to learn how to pray on your own. You're going to have to learn how to worship on your own. You're going to have to learn how to read your Bible and study on your own. You're going to have to learn how to, how to reach out and fellowship and, 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 and learn from God's Word. You're going to have to learn how to do that on your own because it is a personal relationship with God. I'm going to ask the musicians to come help me here. I'm going to get to my last point. The last thing here, I, I'm going to just repeat what I've got, because this last one here is, uh, is obvious, but I hope that we have learned that church is a means and not an end. I hope that we've learned that church is not a brick and mortar structure, but it's rather people. And that our relationship with God is personal and not corporate. But finally, I hope that we've learned that not having church or not having church services is not an excuse to backslide. Just because we're not having church is not a reason to grow slack, and to compromise, and to go off and fulfill the lust of the flesh and go doing whatever you want to do. Just because we're having, not having church doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want to do. Verse number 23 of our text says, hold fast the profession of your faith. What well, it says, our faith, but hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. And then it goes on to say in verse number 25 that being faithful to church service is a big part of doing that. But for whatever reason, if for whatever reason you cannot be in a church service, you still have to hold fast to your profession of faith without wavering. We cannot slack up. We cannot compromise our convictions. We cannot stop pressing in. We cannot stop seeking His face. We've got to go on. Amen. This is not an opportunity to see how lax we can get. No, friend, it could be. I mean, I, mean, I, ho I hope that, you know, well, shoot the Lord Terry here in a couple weeks, maybe we can have church. But, friend, I mean, the rapture may take place at any moment. It may be right here in the middle of this quarantine that the Lord comes. What about your relationship with God? What if you, I mean, you think, well, I, I couldn't be at church. That is not going to be an excuse. You're not going to be able to stand before the Lord and say, well, the reason I wasn't doing very good spiritually is because we couldn't have church. Not having church is not an excuse to backslide. You're going to have to stay strong. Pray. Seek the face of God. Amen. If you'll move God's way, He'll move yours. You'll draw near to Him, the Bible says, and He'll draw nigh unto you. What have we learned? Well, I hope we've learned this. If you don't learn anything else, I hope you've learned that this is not an opportunity to slack up. It's not an opportunity to backslide. It's not an excuse. We've got to stay faithful and hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Holy Ghost. I thank you for each born-again believer that is maintaining their relationship with you. Lord, even though we've not been able to be at church, even though we've not been able to go on with our tra traditional church services, amen, Lord, we, I, I, I'm thankful and grateful for those that are still pressing on, still holding on, still maintaining their relationship with you, even growing, flourishing, being everything that you intended for them to be. But I'm asking you right now to help those that are struggling, those who didn't have good habits and Christian discipline. I'm asking you, Lord, to help them right now. Lord, that they would determine in their heart that they're not going to lose out. They're not going to lose ground. They're not going to slack up. They're not going to lose what they've gained. They're going to press in and dig in and pray and seek your face and do whatever it, it takes to be everything that you intend for them to be. Help us, Lord, as the church, not this building, not this location, but Lord, the church, we the people, the church, 
Help us to be everything that you want us to be. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I want more 